Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we, uh, untypically, atypically, we will start on time, and uh, that's uh, because we have some uh, very distinguished uh, visitors uh, uh, with us, and also a full schedule of uh, uh, presentations and uh, uh, discussion. Uh, Ambassador King. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, it's uh, a, a great pleasure to welcome you all here on this occasion. But before I get to the occasion uh, itself, I would uh, uh, like to remember a, a sadder uh, occasion. As uh, uh, you know, last Friday, uh, George Herbert Walker pushed the uh, 41st ambassador of the uh, 41st president of the United States. Uh, died and uh, in this room and in this library uh, we have uh, many memories and uh, documents of uh, President Bush and of his uh, relationship to this country and to uh, President Václav Havel in particular. He was the very first uh, American president that uh, Václav Havel visited in February 1990 in uh, the Oval Office of the White House. He was uh, the first American president to come to Czechoslovakia in uh, November 1990 to celebrate the first anniversary of the Velvet Revolution uh, with uh, not just Václav Havel, but 100,000 people on the Wenceslas uh, uh, Square. And uh, uh, he was uh, also the president that Václav Havel developed a very strong personal rapport with and uh, a mutual friendship and uh, they kept uh, meeting. Uh, uh, Václav Havel visited President Bush after he retired in his uh, residence in Kennebunkport, Maine. I was lucky to be with him there on that occasion and we spent uh, a very moving day and evening with uh, President, uh, his wife Barbara and the family in, in their home. And uh, last but not least, on the 10th anniversary of the uh, Velvet Revolution, President Havel uh, awarded uh, President Bush the highest uh, Czech uh, award, the Order of White Lion to uh, to acknowledge his uh, contribution to freedom and democracy of Czechoslovakia and uh, and uh, and Europe, so we owe President Bush uh, a great debt. We have a small token of remembrance here of one of his uh, meetings with President Havel, and we will always remember him fondly. Uh, now for the present occasion there was uh, another American president who is uh, not so well remembered in uh, this country or in most countries around the world. For most part it was uh, because of his uh, uh, association with the Great Depression uh, for mm, which he certainly was not the one to, to blame but he uh, bore some of the blame nonetheless. This is uh, uh, politics, mind you, and uh, this, is, uh, this is how things are. But before he was uh, 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 the president, he also played a very important role as a uh, humanitarian, as a man of charity and compassion, and he initiated and uh, helped organize the uh, American Relief Administration uh, at the end of the uh, First World War, which uh, uh, included uh, a number of uh, starving countries and their populations in Europe after the Revolutionary <coughs> War, in Belgium, in Poland, in Czechoslovakia, and elsewhere. And we saw in the library that uh, it is important that we should remember his role and his contribution because, you know, these days uh, uh, I sometimes feel like uh, 
the people in the Monty Python's uh, The Life of Brian, you know, when someone says, you know, what have the Romans ever done for us? And they, uh, they keep silent for a moment and then someone says sanitation, aqueduct, hygiene, public health, uh, and, and this is uh, what we hear today, you know, what uh, have the Americans ever done for Europe, what have they done for us, and uh, we think it's important to remember that they have done a lot, and uh, this is what this uh, symposium, this little symposium is, is all about. Uh, I would like to ask our honorable guest and friend, uh, the Ambassador of the United States, Stephen King, uh, to say a few words in the introduction. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you Michael, friend, uh, esteemed panelists, uh, guests. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here, obviously, to help uh, you focus and kind of open up this uh, conference on the U.S. support to both Czech and Slovak people during the early years of the First uh, Republic. Most of you are aware, I think, of the support that the United States brought to the actual creation of the Czechoslovakian uh, nation, uh, with, of course, working in cooperation with uh, then uh, Tomas Masaryk in his time in the United States, along with uh, politicians as well as Czech and other Slovak expats who were living in the United States at that particular time. Thanks to them, after the war, uh, people in Europe uh, found themselves obviously living in new independent states, but due to the ravages of World War I, uh, many of these Europeans experienced great hunger and food shortages. The expert panelists that you're going to be hearing from uh, shortly, of course, will help you sh uh, shed light and help you understand exactly how much that uh, that administration that uh, Herbert Hoover led at that time actually did on behalf of, uh, of the Europeans. Hoover, at the time, worked closely with a personal friend of his, whose name was, he was a banker, and his name was uh, Abraham Rasheski. Uh, he asked his friend to help him find ways and logistics of helping Europeans after World War I. Beyond his work as a banker, Rasheski was a social activist and a philanthropist who in uh, December of 1917, uh, 1917 this is still during the war, uh, organized a medical relief team in response to what was then called the Halifax disaster, which killed over 2,000 people and injured another 9,000 in Nova Scotia, Canada, following a collision with a ship filled with explosives. When Hoover became president, became the 31st president of the United States, he appointed his friend Rasteski as his ambassador to Prague. And on May 2nd, 1930, uh, Rasteski presented his credentials to President, then President Masaryk. America continued to offer a helping hand even at this period of time. And although the communist government at the time refused assistance from the Marshall Plan uh, following World War II. Forty years later, uh, U.S. Ambassador Basra uh, opened a USAID office here in Prague and uh, welcomed the first Peace Corps volunteers here in the Czech nation. The YMCA, also at the time, which had provided volunteers in a prisoner of war camp in Romov during World War I was also able to return in the 1930s. But I think perhaps my most favorite story uh, is uh, involves the aid packages that were sent to Czechoslovakia by CARE, C-A-R-E, uh, in the 1920s. Uh, Czechs have themselves now 
join CARE, which is still a very outstanding international organization, and are now uh, sending parcels to people in need around the world. So again, a wonderful success story of how the U.S. came to aid Europeans post-World War I, and now many of those same nations, including the Czech Republic, are now assisting people in need around the world. Tomorrow, uh, it'll be one year since I was credentialed, December 6th, I guess it's today, isn't it? Is today the 6th or 5th? I'm not sure. <laughs> I've lost track of that. Five. So tomorrow it is, yeah, right. Uh, and I'm proud, coming here, and even more so today, I'm proud that my predecessors have done so much for this country and its people, and I'm excited about what we can do, of course, to accomplish it and, uh, together over the next 100 years. Michael has stolen some of my thunder, but I wanted to end with this, and that is that uh, today, December 5th, as he has already noted, uh, the United States is recognizing, as it, uh, is recognizing today in the United States as an official day of mourning for our 41st president, President George H.W. Bush, who died last week at the age of 94. Here's a man who, like Maastricht, who, like Havel, kind of led our nation through a period of momentous change. The fall of communist rule here in Central and Eastern Europe, and the collapse of the Soviet Union. As I reflect on the passing of President Bush, uh, from my perspective as the current United States Ambassador, uh, the Czech Republic is now a prosperous, democratic country with a strong free market economy. I'm reminded of his visit, as Michael's already noted, here in Prague, uh, when he became the first American president to actually uh, visit Czechoslovakia and speak directly to the Czech people in Wenceslas Square. As he said then, and this is the way I want to end, and I'll be quoting President Bush here, as he said then, and I repeat now, America will stand with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you, Stephen, for those apt and moving words. And uh, uh, we will now start with uh, uh, our program. I will invite uh, the first two of our panelists on the podium. I will shortly introduce them and uh, we may begin. Uh, we will start with the lady, Professor Halina Parafianovic. I can't seem to get it right, but I'm getting there. I'm closer. Uh, is uh, a, a professor of, of history at the Bialystok uh, University in Poland and a uh, field of uh, expertise uh, is uh, uh, Polish and Czech-American relationship uh, in the 20th century. She uh, uh, wrote uh, several books uh, on the subject. Uh, she may be more expert at uh, uh, some of the Czech-American history than most of the Czech historians are. Uh, uh, with one exception in this room. <laughs> and uh, uh, she, uh, so she's uh, very competent to, to speak on the subject. As is our second panelist, uh, Professor uh, Bernard Patenaud, uh, uh, who is a uh, professor of uh, history and international relations at the Stanford University and also a scholar at the Hoover Institution at, uh, at Stanford. And uh, he 
researches and writes on uh, many relevant topics of uh, modern European uh, history. Among his books is a book on uh, Leon Trotsky, which actually came out in Czech. Uh, Leon Trotsky is not uh, one of our favorite subjects in, in this room, but uh, admittedly he did play a part in, in the early, early 20th century European history. But uh, today it's uh, all about uh, 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 American uh, uh, relief administration and uh, food aid at uh, uh, the end of the First World War and, uh, and related matters. Uh, which of you uh, professors would like to start first? In program, you are here. Mm -hmm. so, and so, anyway, uh, if I may Your start, right. Please. Uh, it's my great honor and pleasure, and thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Jantowski, for this wonderful opportunity for me to be back to Prague. I am uh, honored and very pleased that I can talk a bit, because we, we have very limited time. Uh, for our presentation, but I hope that we'll have uh, more time to uh, respond to your questions, inquiries, and comments, and so on. But anyway, uh, it's a real privilege to talk on Herbert Hoover, who uh, himself uh, was uh, a hero of my many years of research, uh, because I also wrote his biography and another book, my PhD, on his presidency. But now I will talk on another topic which was and still is close to my very dear for me, uh, Czech-American relations, and I try to cover just a few reflections on, on, on it. So, Hoover, you are, I, I saw a few pictures already, uh, 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 on his activities, uh, somebody prepared for this presentation. So uh, I greatly am, and also admire this if you just put it on, because it helps to uh, uh, somehow to vis visualize it. Uh, Hoover uh, is uh, uh, a real hero, self made man, American, uh, great. Uh, public servant, a great humanitarian, uh, a visionary. Uh, if you search for the books and titles on books on him, most of them will cover uh, his, uh, not presidential years, but his humanitarian aid and uh, secretaryship in a commerce department. So uh, when we talk on him, First of all, we're talking on his activities uh, since the First World War. Until then, this uh, son of Quaker blacksmith from Iowa, from Midwear, uh, orphan, uh, a student at Stanford University, very successful then businessman, uh, an expert in mining, uh, became a public servant during the First World War. He wanted to share his experience, his health, his money. He became a millionaire till then. So he had been involved in Wilson's administration as an expert, a food director of food administration, and then American Relief Administration. Uh, the organization uh, started to function in uh, February 19, uh, uh, 1919, but informally it started even before with some emergency help for some European, the most needy uh, countries. So when we look on this part of his activities, we should know that uh, he became a really greatly, fully involved in public matters, in economic matters, financial, and first of all, humanitarian, uh, because uh, a few more years he devoted for the organization 
we show here, we saw this map over there for a few minutes. It covers all, most of European countries and for many months and sometimes years, because later it was private organization, uh, it distributed food, medical supply, some uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, dresses, shoes, uh, so very essential basic sometimes things which were needed in desperate uh, parts of Europe devastated after, after the war and famine. Let me uh, take a quotation uh, uh, on his, uh, on his uh, part of activities which covered, of course, in Central European countries, Czechoslovakia, Poland, Austria, but also part of Germany and Soviet Union. So, uh, Hoover believed uh, that through uh, a proper distribution of food, it was possible to influence the maintaining law and order and in the disturbed by war and revolutions the world. Uh, he never hit hit criticism towards uh, even hostile uh, attitude towards communism, yet uh, ARA activities in Soviet uh, Russia saved millions of lives there in communist uh, country. When, it, when uh, he, somebody asked him in interview why he had spent, sent corn instead wet to Russia, a quotation, he answered abruptly, because for one dollar I may buy more calories, the end of quotation. It means that uh, uh, in a very tragic situation, he just uh, judged in this very humanitarian way how to save lives in a desperate situation. Of course, uh, the IRA activities uh, always has been the source of controversy or some arguments, but not apart from charitable, charitable humanitarian aspects, never ever uh, discussed uh, uh, or uh, um, uh, somehow judged that it's not happened. It happened. But some other uh, showed also ideological or political or economic reasons and so on. Uh, of course, I think we will have uh, some time to discuss it because the most important, in my judgment, is charitable action. It's humanitarian. This is for sure. But of course, uh, he became quite uh, soon also politicians, so he was thinking also in other ways and uh, like uh, uh, attempts to find uh, a new outlet for American products of the production or stop spreading communism. I think it's somehow obvious. I, uh, let, let me uh, use the quotation from his close friend and collaborator, um, uh, Rai Lehman Wilbur, who wrote this quotation. Uh, Mr. Hoover at once went abroad with two points of view in mind. One was to find market for the American producer, and the other was to see that Bolshevism did not spread through Europe because of starvation. The activities of, uh, of RAA and the American uniform became the symbol of reconstruction of Europe, particularly Central Europe. In broad lines, as we can say, that our country under Mr. Hoover's guidance came to the rescue of the disorganized and tarnished people who had been crushed by Germany and the war and brought to them not only food, what was essential, but hope, the end of quotation. And I think it's uh, quite significant that looking on his uh, tremendous charitable uh, work of many of his uh, so-called Hoover's men, over 4,000 people 
called Hoover's Men were working in different countries, including Czechoslovakia. Hoover's, in his memo memoirs, uh, counted that they were uh, about 30, his close corporations, cooperators, uh, collaborators. Actually, uh, there are very nice uh, uh, quotations on three, on only three pages of his memoirs. Uh, I wouldn't use your time, uh, but they are very significant how he looked on his charitable, and not only charitable, as he uh, defined it, uh, uh, job words. But uh, he visited Prague, this I want to uh, briefly mention, in summer uh, 1918, on the road to Poland, to Warsaw, and uh, it, uh, then uh, he talked to, to, he gave instructions, he visited some uh, kitchens, uh, and as he put it in memoirs, uh, I want to quote it, the Czechs, gave me a most vociferous reception. Cheering crowds, dinners, speeches, university degrees, and domicile in the ancient castle where nobody served me breakfast. One of the great streets leading to Wilson Square, Beers, or did Beer, my name. He was not sure because it was published after the Second World War, if it happened. Then, on in 38, his sentimental visit, which also covered Czechoslovakia. So anyway, in the years to come, uh, Hoover, as humanitarian and benefactor, who saved truly millions of Europeans, mostly Europeans from starvation, was admired and almost worshipped. I want to say this because I am talking in, about the past, then in interwar periods, he was remembered. His name uh, became, was quite familiar for Central Europeans, for Czechs, Poles, Slovak, but also Belgians, Finns, uh, Italians. He symbolized and personified the best of America, its idealism, humanity, and charity. And he says the opportunity of a prosperous and wealthy country with shared ideals and wealth with the needy Europeans. So uh, they are tremendous. I think we will may have uh, in second panel to discuss it, to discuss it but uh, the, a lot of kind of gratitude was uh, uh, manifested by letters of congratulations and gratitude to him and uh, ARA workers, honorary titles, uh, medals, uh, uh, special albums with the signatures of thousands of people, thousands. Uh, many streets were named after him uh, on via Hoover, Hooverstrasse, uh, or Rue Hoover, but also after Wilson, and in general, America. So it, it was a sign how people just were grateful and presented. The new um, uh, asteroid discovered in 1920 uh, in, by a professor from Vienna was named Hooveria. This is also symbolic in 1920. So uh, we may say, and it happened also in Prague or in Czechoslovakia in general, that his name, uh, like also Wilson, was somehow cherished, was remembered for these activities, for this kitchen established, for this food service, for medical supplies and so on. Uh, in Poland, uh, in 1922, uh, a special monument uh, <laughs> of gratitude to America, Hoover and Wilson was unveiled in Warsaw. This is beautiful. If we have time later, I show this in, 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 uh, in my presentation also, but uh, uh, I'm afraid that we don't have time. So uh, on the occasion, I, I, I want to just mention briefly, because it was exceptional way how, how Poles showed their gratitude on the occasion of 100th 
50 years of United States independence in 1926. Uh, they are presented to, pres uh, to President Coolidge uh, 111 uh, albums with signatures of five and a half million of Poles who uh, put signatures, sometimes notes, and it was uh, nicely uh, organized in albums and dedicated, and whose name was quite, uh, was mentioned then quite often, and in general America. So, streets, hospitals, especially in Eastern Poland, uh, was also uh, somehow commemorated as great activities. And I know that also in Czechoslovakia, after Masaryk, sometimes he uh, and Wilson was mentioned uh, on uh, all kind of uh, uh, events or 4th of July or uh, Czech Independence Day. So uh, we should also remember that uh, it, it was also a way to Americanize Central Europe, to, um, to show American uh, and implement American ideals, American methods of uh, work, Ford, Fordism. Uh, uh, President Masaryk was very fond of it and through his connections and uh, with America, through his marriage and uh, uh, his visits in America before the First World War and uh, this cooperation with, uh, with Wilson, of course, uh, Czechoslovakia and Prague uh, itself became uh, uh, somehow a, a place to uh, for Americanization, in, in a sense, uh, that uh, some ideals and methods were also uh, implemented here. So, uh, just briefly, uh, I think uh, that this tremendous humanitarian work, this is obvious, uh, pushed him into public activity and then in political activities, very successful as Secretary of Commerce, and then very unsuccessful uh, uh, president uh, uh, during the uh, Great Crisis in the 30s. Uh, I believe that uh, mm, this is irony and uh, sort of uh, misunderstanding that uh, mm, he uh, lived and uh, he was presented also by historians in such, uh, between two legends, between two opposite images. First one, uh, white, I would say white legend or white image, very positive, connected with his, uh, this activity, what we're talking about, uh, his humanitarian night. And the second, uh, black image or black legend, uh, after his, uh, uh, presidency. He was forgotten even uh, by Americans, not only by Europeans. And actually I used this forgotten president as a title of my biography on him. Because uh, when I search American historical writings and knowledge on him, he was it was based mostly on his uh, presidency which was uh, very uh, critical presented by most historians and of course by rivals and uh, Democrats, Roosevelt and later. So even his sentimental journey in 38, in uh, February, March in Europe, he visited also Prague, Poland, uh, Berlin, Sweden, Finland, many countries, didn't revoke his positive image or uh, his gratitude so uh, visibly showed in the beginning, in the early 20s, when people really remember this. And of course, after the Second World War, as we know, he also worked in the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation uh, Organization. So then he visited again our countries, Central Europe, and he became somehow well known even in communist propaganda, there were some informations and notes on it. But, just 
not conclusion because we will decide. Just uh, I would say that I am very fond of the title of Czech author uh, Stanisław Szpaczek, who published book in 1922 in Prague, and he just uh, put very single title Herbert Herbert Hoover, engineer of humanity. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs>
which technically was called the American Relief Administration European Children's Fund. Look at your poster and you see up at the top, the, the initials going along the top, A-R-A-E-C-F. That was the technical name, but nobody called it that. Everyone still called it uh, the ARA. So what I'm gonna do in the next few minutes is just focus on what I regard as the more important of the two operations. It's the ARA during the armistice period. Uh, it's the most significant thing America does after World War I. Arguably, it's the Marshall Plan precursor, right? We, heard, we hear a lot about the Marshall Plan after World War II. We never hear about the Hoover Plan, uh, but that's what this was. And the most important area of activity of this ARA was right here. In other words, in Central Europe, uh, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, and, and your poster gives this away, Austria, which at the time was called German Austria. More about that in a minute. So it's the Austro-Hungarian Empire uh, that's broken up into five pieces. We have new states. They are like children learning to walk, with all due respect. Uh, very challenging uh, to know how they're going to govern these new states. Lots of confusion, understandably. Lots of disorder. So Hoover and the ARA, together with the Brits and the French, and that's a troubled relationship we don't have time for today, uh, tries to put these new countries on their feet. Food delivery is important. But um, American mediation, American intermediation, American conciliation, the presence of Americans in these countries and serving as mediators between them is absolutely critical. So there's um, reestablishing communications. The Americans who get to Prague in February of 1919 suddenly realize they have no way to communicate with the outside world. Prague is cut off, literally cut off. So they have to begin establishing uh, post and telegraph, which they do. Uh, transportation, railroads are a mess. When the empire breaks up, each of the constituent parts, the new countries, is keeping the railroad rolling stock that ends up in their particular country against all the rules that have been worked out in Paris. Uh, the coal industry, vitally important. More about that in a moment. Uh, and then reestablishing commerce. Um, the Austro-Hungarian Empire was an economic unit. Uh, Vienna was the center, as most of you know. And there were various centers of industry and agriculture, but it worked as a single unit. Now it no longer exists. So we have a lot of fragments. And the point, Hoover's point, Hoover's goal is to, sta to establish trade relations between the various uh, fragments. Now the problem is, this is challenging enough, sort of bringing the buyers and sellers in the region uh, into a, sort of a marketplace that they can reconstitute. That would be complicated enough, but what the Americans find when they get here is that those new countries tend to, can I speak bluntly, hate each other. There's a lot of animosity among them, between them. It's very complicated for the Americans in particular to arrive and to figure this out. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment, and, and in particular in the, in the uh, Czech example, Czechoslovak example. Let me get to that um, uh, right now. So the particulars. Um, Helena uh, brought it out beautifully that this is a, a country with strong ties to the U.S., and benefits from that, I mean, the, the working out of the Constitution for this new state, Czechoslovakia, was done in Pittsburgh. It's done in the United States. Uh, Thomas Masaryk is in Washington uh, before he comes to assume the post of president. If you count dependents and the children of people who've come over, uh, 1.7 million Czechoslovak people in the United States uh, in 1918. Um, so we have this, these advantages. The other advantage is that uh, Czechoslovakia is well endowed with industry. In 1912, two thirds of Austro Hungarian exports came from Bohemia. 56% of industrial enterprises in Austria Hungary were within Bohemia, Moravia, 
or Austrian Silesia. So there are advantages that uh, Czechoslovakia begins with. Um, its frontiers, though, are very uncertain. And I'll deal with the three powers and then wrap up uh, the three countries that are most troubling. One is Poland. Strong distrust, and I'll say, I'll use Czechs here, on the uh, part of the Czechs uh, toward the Poles. There's actually fighting uh, between the two in the winter of 1919 over control of the Teschen oil fields. It's wrapped up by the end of February. Um, and I'll give you an example of the problem the Americans are trying to deal with during this period. The Poles have potatoes in surplus. The Czechs have sugar in surplus. Let's make a deal. Well, maybe not. Uh, as they look across at each other, it's not that easy. Hoover and the Americans facilitate the deal. Very strenuous negotiations. If you read the documents, you'll get tired of hearing about Polish potatoes and Czech sugar. They, 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 they serve as mediators. They get the deal done. And then they stick those two parties to that deal through thick and thin. There's a lot of bad stuff that goes on. Eventually, Czechoslovakia gets about 22,000 tons of potatoes. And the Poles, lucky them, get 1,300 tons of sugar. So that's Poland. And it's really about the, uh, uh, the oil fields. Uh, that's the complication. Then there's Hungary. Relations very, very bad. Um, Hungary reluctantly, only reluctantly, cedes Slovakia to uh, Czechoslovakia. And when it goes, when it evacuates, it takes all the grain, all the fats, and all the railroad rolling stock with it, against all the rules. By the way, at this time, 13 million Czechs, 4.5 million Slovaks. There is a war between uh, Czechoslovakia and Hungary in May and June of 1919. Lasts for six weeks. The Hungarians get the better of it. At one point, they take over one third of Slovakia. Keep in mind, this is while American relief is going on. This tremendously complicates uh, Czechoslovakia's recovery. Some of you will know, in Hungary at this time, in Budapest, is a Bolshevik regime led by Bela Kun. So things are bad with Hungary, we don't have to talk about that again. But things are really bad vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Austrians. The Czechs, and I'll say the Czechs here, hate the Austrians. Um, uh, part of it's set off by the fact that all the Czech locomotives that they were supposed to get, according to the divorce arrangements, uh, the Austrians simply took. But a lot of it is based on a lot of history, 300 years of it, especially recent history, feeling oppressed by Vienna. Um, and so you see this expressed uh, in various ways, in particular because, now don't miss me, don't miss this point here, the number one urgent area that needed relief in 1919 was Austria. Because once the empire broke up, the independent little unit that was deprived of resources more than all the others was Austria. It had all those great buildings, got that great capital um, to run things, but it's got nothing to run. So the Americans want food for the Viennese and for Austria in general. The Czechs are wondering why. What's the hurry, right? So in fact, the Americans make the giving of coal to the Czechs contingent on their giving food to the Austrians. And it works. Okay, almost done. Um, so the ARA, I said, is dissolved to the peace treaty. Now, don't miss this point, because I think a lot of Americans, if they heard this, would scratch their heads. Up to that point, the ARA, that was a government agency, 88% of its relief was food that was sold. It was not charity. It was sold on credit, but eventually it would have to be paid for. 12% was charity. That's the giving to children. And that's the seeds of the ARA ECF that will succeed that earlier uh, ARA. And, you know, for the ARA ECF, for, the, for what goes on in, from 1919 to 1921, it's feeding balanced meals to children, one meal a day, especially for needy children. 40 Americans were in uh, Czechoslovakia, July 1, 1919. Most of them stay through September 1, 1921. That's when the Americans leave. For most of that period, they're feeding a half a million children a day, a daily meal, 
at around 2,000 kitchens throughout the country. So, and I'll end by just mentioning uh, motives. And again, my colleague is very good on this. There's stopping the spread of Bolshevism. Food stops anarchy. Anarchy equals Bolshevism. We've got to get food in there to stop this. Uh, restoring order also helps the American economy recover. The United States needs a healthy Europe. Hoover makes no secret of this, right? We need Europe to recover so that America can trade with it and survive. So that's a big part of this. Hoover's motive is a lot of various things, but it all comes down to, when you read his writings from this period, he's an engineer, right? And he's, he's, a, he's a guy who wants to fix problems. Re-knitting the broken fabric of society. That's at the bottom of this. And the society is basically the Austro-Hungarian Empire that has been obliterated. And a final thing, a final motivation, is a sense of obligation politically. <laughs> It was, after all, Woodrow Wilson who set the process in motion for the Austro-Hungarian Empire to collapse. The 14 points, self-determination of nations, right? We, we, the United States, was more than any other country responsible for this, uh, for these new entities, for these uh, sort of national toddlers trying to walk on the uh, world stage. So we felt that we had a special obligation to help them to do so. Always, for Hoover, the philosophy is help people help themselves. So American ad uh, Relief Administration, very few Americans supervising the work of Czechs, Slovaks, Poles, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah, and the United States was removed from the scene it's regarded really as a neutral, even at the end of the war. And so that enabled it to play this uh, special role. Without Herbert Hoover, though, I'll finish with this. Without that remarkable individual who had all those gifts, and this was the era of the cult of the engineer. Today is the cult of the techie of some type, right? But back then, in particular in the United States, at the end of the war, efficiency was it. He was known as the master of efficiency. Hoover made the wheels turn. Both political parties wanted to draft him to run for president in 1920. He made a mistake. He came out as a Republican. And as soon as he did, the Republicans said, thank you. And they chose someone that the Republican machine wanted because they knew the Democrats couldn't touch him at that point. He had declared as a Republican. His chance would come in 1928. He had the gifts of an engineer. Great Secretary of Commerce should never, can I say this even at the Hoover Institution? They're not listening, are they? Should never have become president. He didn't have the gifts that made Franklin Delano Roosevelt a great president, right? If everything had continued without the Great Crash and the Great Depression, he might have been a great president. Who knows? Thank you. Well, thank you, Bernard, for this fascinating piece of uh, unadorned history. And, uh, you know, we Czechs uh, like to think of ourselves as this dovish, uh, peaceful people who would not hurt a fly, and we owe it to historians like our two distinguished guess here that we know better. Uh, uh, the question out of all this, you know, I think the fundamental question is uh, 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 you made it quite clear, both of you actually, that there was a mixed bag of motifs behind uh, the uh, humanitarian aid to to Czechoslovakia and set Europe after the First World War. Uh, of course, the Marxist historiography always, uh, you know, had it that this was one uh, plan to get rid of uh, uh, the food surplus in the United States at, uh, mm, at uh, a nice price and uh, uh, help uh, the... 
agricultural sector in the United States, and two that it was a, a, a plan to stop Bolshevism in its tracks by uh, showing uh, Central Europe the, the benefits of capitalism and uh, and friendship with. Uh, uh, the United States, the comparison with the Marshall Plan is not uh, uh, that far-fetched. Uh, now, uh, my question to both of you would be to what degree this was a, a deliberate uh, strategy of the US government. Uh, have you come across documents in the State Department or in the White House strategy for which which part of what you just said with the the, the, the products or yeah well the, the food stuff. aid as a political instrument. Yeah. So food is a weapon. Yeah. Yeah. Do you wanna... yeah. Uh, first of all uh, uh, since uh, the food administration uh, when he was director uh, there is a famous post, uh, poster, food will win the war, the first one. And uh, it was, uh, I think, con considered also uh, later on that food can be used, and it was used. There is correspondence between him and uh, Wilson, two volumes published. Uh, from the uh, conference, peace conference, the time of peace conference, when uh, they are arguing that it could be used also as political weapons, in a sense that uh, to stop anarchy, uh, so uh, to fight starvation, it means that uh, uh, it could be uh, established order and law in this disturbed world, because after the dismemberment of Austria-Hungary, <laughs> Americans were not, I'm sorry to say so, but Americans were not so familiar with all these small countries, nationalities already existed. They've got, they've got <laughs> foggy ideas, but Wilson established inquiry group in uh, summer 1917, and he've got more or less 150 experts who were preparing all arguments, economic, cartography, history, uh, 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 ethnographic maps, geography, everything was presented uh, for this audience, but not for the State Department. It was apart from State Department knowledge. But as we know, uh, Wilson came to a um, peace conference without, truly speaking, uh, important uh, re Republicans. There were only two, two in his delegates. So he was arguing only with Democrats on Democrats' issues, their arguments. And it was, I think, also it explains what happened with ratification of the treaty, that it was never ratified, because he didn't support for this vision. But this discussion, uh, how to use, and especially at this um, first part, as Bertrand mentioned, uh, until the end of the conference, when it was governmental agency, of course, they considered all kinds of other aspects, not necessarily or not the most humanitarian. Later, as a private agency, uh, is uh, another uh, question. And uh, for that reason, I use also this quotation for Soviet Union, because uh, there was always in American historical uh, historiography <coughs> arguments that he was anti Bolshevist, anti communist. Of course, he was. There is uh, no, but when he was attacked by American donors, those who collected money in early 20s for this kind of humanitarian aid for Russia, Soviet Russia, he said that he, for one dollar he can buy more calories. It means that he can feed more people and uh, it means that uh, in a, such a dramatic situation on the Volga region and Ural, he can, Ukraine, 
he can uh, help this really millions. In a Soviet encyclopedia in 1926, there is, uh, uh, there is information on a, a race, and it says that one, uh, t 10, 10 million people he, he helped, 10 million from, actually, he, yeah, from starvation. Yeah. 10 million. You could, we wouldn't find this in editions in the 50s of the same Balshaya Sovietska Encyclopedia. No. So it means that then it was recognized as also humanitarian aid. And actually, uh, Bertrand also knows this perfectly in Hoover's library in the West Branch. There is exhibit and there is a very special scroll, scroll. thank you, note from uh, Bolshevis, Bolshevik uh, government, mm -hmm. Kamenev, uh, uh, yeah. who just thanked him in 23 after uh, the ending of this, uh, for serving lives, yeah. just lives. So there was no talk about policy, ideology, economy, just lives, because in this right moment, it was the most important to save lives. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter if in some part it was paid later on as a debt, or debt like in European countries. Mm -hmm. But it means that it was very needed and very helpful then. And it's humanitarian. Yeah. Well, but this is a very nice illustration of a very peculiar approach to communists system had to history, it was uh, the future that was set and, and the past that was changing all the time. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> Andrew Trotsky. Yeah. Yeah, including that. Yeah, Bertrand. So, uh, much to say, I'll keep it short. So a couple of issues here. One is the agricultural surpluses. This is a very good point. Um, the fact is, Herbert Hoover was so good at what he did that when he became food administrator in the summer of 1917, he got to work uh, convincing Americans to save food for the war effort, not just for American troops going over, but food supplies to send to the Allies. So yes, indeed, food will win the war, was the slogan on the poster. Well, he was so good at this, A, uh, to the point where Americans were uh, observing meatless Mondays, wheatless Wednesdays, they loved alliteration back then, and really saving up a lot of food. During the war period, during the time the, uh, the United States was in the war, there was practically a new verb that entered the American vocabulary, to hooverize. Not a vacuum cleaner, but to hooverize meant to, you know, to save. Um, and, but the problem was, Hoover, like most people, was counting on a much longer war. So the war comes to an end uh, very quickly, and there, we have built up a lot of surpluses, and in fact, they need an outlet for those. And so, yes, uh, this was quite, uh, quite convenient. The other thing is, uh, the price of, you know, what I can, uh, Hoover trying to get the best deal for the American farmer. I wrote a book about the ARA mission in the famine in Soviet Russia in 1921-23. Millions threatened with starvation. Millions will die, at least six million, possibly as high as 10. Uh, the ARA saves many millions. There's a moment there. They go in to feed children, just as they have been doing throughout Europe. They're going to go in and feed children. They begin to feed the children, and the calls come out from the Americans inside Soviet Russia we can't do this. We are going to create millions of orphans. We have to feed the adults. The ARA hasn't done that in Europe, not in 1919, 1920, 21. So they set up a program to feed adults. And Hoover goes to Congress and he gets $20 million to spend on corn. Now, why corn? <laughs> there are a lot of congressmen and senators who represented the wheat interests. Why not wheat? Hoover's idea was, we have corn, we are burning it for fuel, we have it in abundance, we'll get more bang for the buck, let's get rid of the corn. So they do. And so Russians begin to eat corn in the winter uh, of 1921-22 and so on. The interesting moment was that they also sent over, the ARA did, seed 
to plant the harvest of 1922. And that really ended the famine there. But when the call came in, can we send overseas? Hoover said, sure, if the Soviet government spends part of its gold reserve, real businessman, and pays for it. So they did. But then Hoover said, let's plant corn because we have it in abundance. And at that point, the guys in Moscow, and they're all guys, drew the line. And they just said, you know, they called him the chief. That was his nickname, chief. We cannot. They will, it will be a disaster. They don't know corn. They can't plant corn. We need wheat, and we need it from the north of the Midwest. Um, we, we need something that will do well in Russia. Hoover came around on this. But the idea with Hoover is always you can do a good thing for the United States, self-interest, while doing a good deed for someone else. Now, on the stopping Bolshevism thing, uh, this is a very big deal. Um, and so when Hoover went in to feed the, uh, the Russians, the Soviet Russian famine, there were a lot of people on the left in the United States looking at what he was doing and worrying that he had some nefarious motive in mind. What are you going to do? The Bolsheviks, of course, were very nervous about this. And the reason is Hoover made no secret in 1919, 1920, that the ARA was involved in one of the biggest fights uh, that the West was facing. It was the fight against the spread of anarchy, meaning Bolshevism, right, small p. And Hoover was not alone. Woodrow Wilson, Secretary of State Robert Lansing, all of these people believed food stops Bolshevism. And you just got to get the food over there. The point is, it's a false choice to say that Hoover either had humanitarian motives or he had political motives. Stopping Bolshevism was humanitarian. Everyone thought of it that way at the time, right? So you have to go back and put yourself in their heads. Woodrow Wilson's, Herbert Hoover's. The idea is you rescue people from starvation and from uh, wacko radical ideas. Um, and one other thing on that, and that is the self-determination thing. It's a well-known fact that Woodrow Wilson set this whole train in motion, right? The little nations and the small nations. One of the reasons he was motivated um, was because two little nations were involved in the start of World War I. Serbia, what was the other one? I always do this to my students and they're like, uh. uh anybody? Belgium. Remember the Germans go through Belgium to get to France, that brings the Brits in. And Hoover used this as a reason to um, include, you know, back the small nations. But at a certain point during the peace conference, and we have this from Hoover's papers and Lansing's papers, Secretary of State, Wilson said, I had no idea that there were this many. They didn't really solve the problem, they devolved it down to smaller units where they still had minorities, right? In many cases, these are not nation states. They're still states, like Czechoslovakia, with two nations. So, so Wilson was really disillusioned toward the end, all that expertise, and then we get even more problems only at a different level, uh, on a different playing field. Okay. Oh, all right, that's what you get for believing in self-determination, <laughs> uh, I suppose. But uh, the, the proof of the pudding that you know we're looking for here is uh, is whether there's any evidence that uh, Hoover or the US administration leveraged the aid for political purposes whether they made the aid conditional on you do this you don't do this and to my very limited knowledge, there's very scarce evidence of that. Well, just there is just one case that's famous, uh, um, and that became notorious when Hoover was going to Soviet Russia, and that was the case of Hungary in 1919. As I said earlier, we have a Bolshevik revolution, um, and we have a man named Bela Kun, who is ruling according to the Soviet model, you know, the Lenin of Hungary, and Hoover decides. Um, to use food as a weapon. And so the message to the Hungarians is, you want food, uh, you're not going to get it with um, these hooligans and rascals, foolish people 
Hoover loved using that word, with this foolish economic system, we will hold up the ship of food. So it's not giving food to enemies of Belokun. That was the accusation. He was holding back food. Uh, Belokun falls in part because of this. But then, here's the example Hoover liked to mention. There was an Austrian archduke who tried to take over in Budapest after the fall of Belokun. <laughs> and Hoover, we have great memos on this. No way. Um, we're not going to do this. And they got the word to the archduke. Can't think of his name. Um, this is not going to work. You're not going to get any food. We kindly suggest that you step aside. We don't need a, a shift from radical left to radical right. And Hoover always used this as the example of how it wasn't simply left-wing politics, right? You had to be in the mainstream. And um, we couldn't have the old regime back. The worst radicalism was taking place in those places where before the war they were the most uh, conservative. And Hoover said, we're done with that. So, yeah, food was used as a weapon. <laughs> yeah, I think a uh, Polish example is another one, to some extent, uh, because uh, uh, at the end of uh, December uh, 18, there were talks about Polish government, how to change, and to, make, to involve Paderewski uh, as a prime minister. And it was also uh, connected with food. That it means that then, uh, in January, before the formal uh, in, in, uh, installation of ARA, Poland will get food support. And there are documents on it. Exactly. It's happened. But the rescue became prime minister, and then uh, also foreign minister, <laughs> because uh, uh, it, he became a uh, symbolized order that and better uh, cooperation with the United States that it will be somehow better than sort of dictatorship or rightist movement in Poland then in this very disorganized country uh, also in, in the war with neighbors so it, 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 it's happened this way, uh, and food and Kellogg, Frank Kellogg, came before the official, in, in the beginning of uh, January 1919, and established first uh, uh, administrative staff and first kitchens in Poland. And if I can just add two points on that. Um, let's not forget there is a red scare um, in the United States in 1919. And Hoover is a true believer in the idea that if the uh, Red Menace, as we would call it in the 50s, I'm not sure we called it that uh, in 1919, 1920, but if the Bolshevik threat um, grows in Europe, it won't be long before it threatens the United States. They really thought of this as a kind of disease caused by an empty stomach that acted like a virus and then people would you know, spread all around the world and eventually get to the U.S. So that's one. The second thing is, when the ARA goes into Soviet Russia in 1921, this is a massive, catastrophic famine, uh, I mean, huge thing. Um, so Hoover's accused of having political motives. And, but what he's accused, and he does, and he's trying to bring down the Bolshevik regime. But most of his critics thought, you know, machine guns are gonna be brought in with the relief supplies. I mean, very crude stuff, or that, Food would be given to the whites against the ruling reds. Again, no way. Hoover's idea was that he could undermine that regime in Moscow by the example of American benevolence, right? By the example of American efficiency. That was the big word of the time, master of efficiency. And these <laughs> Americans under him were sort of engineer-minded the way he was. And then eventually, if you feed enough people, they will come to their senses and they'll throw the bums out. In other words, they'll rise up and kick the Bolsheviks out. He had no clue. And when the first reports begin to arrive from the Americans who get to Moscow, and they say the Bolsheviks are, and this is the word they used over and over, firmly in the saddle. Um, very popular Western American term back then. There's no alternative to the Bolsheviks. They are here to stay. Hoover was distraught because he's already in and he's got to start feeding. They feed, and two years later, 
they leave. And they probably ended up shoring up Lenin's government by defeating the famine, saving the harvest, giving Lenin's government the chance then to go on, which is a real irony, because Hoover was known as a Bolshevik killer. Uh, and he may ended up, have ended up saving Lenin's government. That's depressing. <laughs> it well, gets more and more interesting. Does it speak ill of his uh, political instincts, or does it speak well of his humanitarian instincts? It's, yeah, I don't. Yeah, it's hard to say. He, uh, but I think in, he hadn't been in Russia since before the war. I think he just didn't understand. That's where he, the engineer in him was very good, but the politician uh, had something lacking. As an engineer, he's looking at this economic system and he's saying, this cannot last, and the famine must be the first indication that the Bolsheviks are going to fall. He was wrong. This can last. The Bolsheviks have wiped out all opposition. Um, and then Hoover's instinct also said to not recognize the Bolshevik regime either then or all the way through his presidency. The United States did not recognize the USSR until after Hoover had left office and FDR came in as president. Um, and, you know, most of the rest of the uh, European countries had recognized the USSR way back in 1921, 22, latest 1924. Um, so, again, you know, not always the best instincts politically, I think. When did Czechoslovakia recognize Soviet Union? I should know that, but... Uh, when did they... 34, right? Yeah, quite late. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, okay. Uh, well, I don't want to monopolize this uh, discussion, and I'm, I'm sure there are questions from the floor or contributions from the floor that uh, uh, some of you would uh, like to make. So the floor is now open and, uh, and please. And there's a roving microphone. And there's a roving microphone that uh, will make the rounds until someone speaks up. So um, while someone's getting their courage up, if I can point one thing out you may have heard of. When I say the Czech Legion, yeah. do you? Czechoslovak Legion. <laughs> the Czechoslovak, you know, the Americans in 1918-19 do the Czech thing when they mean Czechoslovak. I always get embarrassed. Uh, the Czechoslovak Legion, people know what that is? So, uh, uh, sort of uh, a Czechoslovak military unit that goes to the Eastern Front to fight with Russia against Germany. The Bolshevik Revolution comes, the Soviets pull out of the war, and that legion is stuck there. If you don't know the story, there must be a, a Czech or Czechoslovak movie made of it. So the idea is, we need them on the Western Front. They thought the war would go on for years. So the idea was that they would go through Siberia <coughs> all the way around the world, and then you know, stop back in, in France, and then go in and fight on the Western Front. Imagine. Well, they get caught up in the Russian uh, Civil War, just getting underway in the spring of 1918. So it's um, it's uh, whites versus reds, and one of the real sort of detonators of the Civil War was the Czech Legion spread out along the Trans-Siberian Railway and capturing large parts of it. They would eventually get out and, and come all the way around the world and go to the, uh, I almost said the, the West Coast. They would go to the Western Front. Um, but while that was taking place, that example of the mighty Czechs, uh, Czechoslovaks and their legion fighting against all odds, that appealed to Woodrow Wilson, the little countries, right? And that de um, developed, that, that um, uh, um, enhanced the American sense of owing something to Czechoslovakia, this new government. That's part of the package, too. Well, may I add something? Please. Because, uh, well, uh, we should remember that uh, uh, Wilson quite late. Wilson, I'm sorry. Wilson quite late. I approved the idea of independence of Czechoslovakia, and American Legion was one of these causes, which uh, um, 
the mass outbreak already in the United States since May 18th used. We can look through New York Times. Since then, Czechoslovak, sometimes confused, Czech, Slovak, Slovene, uh, Americans have got foggy ideas about all this kind of Slavic uh, uh, nations and later states. But it became part of official narrative in media, uh, Czechoslovak religion. And Masaryk and Slovak also leaders, Stefanik, uh, before, when he tried to uh, raise uh, soldiers uh, in the United States, Actually, he, been, he was unsuccessful then, but he did it in Europe. So, of course, military uh, involvement of Czechs and Slovaks, soldiers everywhere, were very important to persuade first Europeans, but very late Americans, because Czechoslovak Council was uh, recognized by Europeans in, in uh, June and by America only in uh, September 18, right. when officially Austria-Hungary was dismembered. Yeah. So there was no way to say no, because before uh, Wilson Rade or his government approved uh, so, let's say, uh, national autonomy, cultural or expanded autonomy in, in the uh, Habsburg Empire. So, uh, of course, uh, the Masaryk activities in the United States, all kind of uh, political friendships uh, helped to uh, propagate the idea of independence, also Czechoslovakia, but it was the last actual last country yeah. uh, which yeah. was recognized as an uh, independent right. country and unfortunately I have to say so. Well, no, if, I, if I may, uh, <laughs> there seem to have been two complementary uh, processes going on. On the one hand, there's no question that Masaryk milked the Czechoslovak legions for what they were. Mm -hmm. And they were worse quite a lot because, you know, at one point they apparently controlled one third of Siberia, which is mm -hmm. quite yeah. a feat for a, a few thousand uh, soldiers. Uh, unfortunately, they seem also to have indirectly contributed to the demise of the Tsarist family because as they were approaching uh, the spot where the Tsar and the family were held, the yeah, the we were yeah, about yeah. yeah. Uh, decided to, sh you know, just have them shot. Uh, but on the other hand, I think it was hard to predict the speed with which the Austrian Empire was collapsing. And uh, uh, what may not have been clear in the spring of 1918, was was quite clear in the October 1918. It just could not survive. Right. Mm -hmm. Questions. I have, I have one other small point I want to make, but I know there are like people dying to ask questions. Yeah. Well, maybe they're already dead. Maybe. <laughs> 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 oh, here we go. Yeah. Uh, one uh, small question. Uh, I've read interview with. Arthur C. England, maybe you know this guy. Uh, this guy was one of the Hoover's guy guys uh, in uh, in Europe after the First World War, and uh, he was chief officer of ARA in Czechoslovakia. And he mentioned in the sixties that uh, in the winter nineteen twenty, probably twenty one, they gave in Czechoslovakia. Uh, 600,000 meals per day to the children, uh, which is a pretty huge, huge number. Uh, my question, because I'm not a specialist on this field, if it is possible uh, from your point of view. And uh, second, you know, uh, President Hoover and also Arthur Searing got uh, the order of White Lion in 1926 when they visited Czechoslovakia. So, 
Um, that's the point of, of tradition. And, and on the first, about that. yeah. On the first question, I'm not sure I heard the second one, but on the first one, you said six hundred thousand a day. Yeah, I said a rough average of five hundred thousand. There was the time a uh, period of several months where it was six hundred thousand children a day being fed. Um, and what was the second question again? Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, may I add because uh, just uh, in. Um, the American Relief in Czechoslovakia, a sketch of the children feeding operations of the uh, mission to Czechoslovakia, which was published in 23rd uh, in, uh, in the United States, in New York. Uh, they are very strict. I didn't want to keep you with uh, these details, but in 1918, they were 1,633 uh, 1, kitchens. Uh, average threat by day, daily, it's about 250,000. And total meals for over four, uh, eight millions mm -hmm. together. And then in 20, uh, uh, it's rising, this, this all uh, details. 100, 1,090 of two kitchens. Uh, average fed daily, 271, and total meals, 81 millions. So it gives, and then in 21, Dropped it off. drops. Yeah. Now, for, for 192 kitchens, so some were closed already, and about 97,000 uh, fed daily. So these are official ARAs, and actually this is, uh, it was published and reprinted, so it's accessible to get all these uh, details uh, from New York. Uh, One of the challenges of working on this topic, as I'm sure Helena knows, is that you have so many figures. Yeah, absolutely and, different. And after a while you're looking at tons and you're looking at, you know, the meals and numbers and thousands and how many zeros was that? Yeah. And you have to go do something else, play with the cats or something, and then come back and get started again because yeah. it's just really kind of boring, right? Mm -hmm. um, one thing, can't let this go. Um, one of the things I was struck with before I left um, California to come out here, rereading re my files on what the Americans were experiencing here. So I was saying to Veronica and to others, when I flew in, I'm thinking Prague in December. I've been here once before in December, and there's going to be nobody around. I'll be the only tourist. I will feel like so Czech, right? So I get here, and I could not believe the number of tourists. I mean, the tourist season doesn't end, right? I mean, it's, it's quite remarkable. And the Americans, when they arrive in February 1919, cannot believe how beautiful this city is. They had not heard of it before, Prague. And one of the reasons for this, and it's one of the things they find that the Czechs and the citizens of residents of Prague complain about, is that the railroads were designed in the Austro-Hungarian Empire to go to Vienna and a few other cities, but not to Prague. It was very hard to get to Prague in the old days. So there are some lines, I wish I had brought the text with me. Some of the Americans are saying, heaven help Prague if the world finds out how beautiful it is. It will, tourists will descend, they don't use the word tourists, but you know, foreigners will descend from every corner. Well, that barn, you know, that horse left the barn a long time ago. Um, but it's just sort of remarkable that Prague is this sort of undiscovered gem to these American visitors uh, in 1919. Mm -hmm. Not any longer. Yeah, well, uh, just I would like to add from historical point of view from the 20s, uh, because uh, the ambassador mentioned about Raczewski, the envoy in the 30s, but the first envoy here, American envoy, was Crane. Richard Crane, son of uh, Charles Crane, real, very close friend of Czech, Czechoslovakia, Masaryk, and, uh, and so on. And then Einstein, and both of them, uh, these diplomats, were very fond of Czechoslovakia and Prague. And uh, I don't remember now all this uh, data from uh, about tourists, but Prague in 
the late 20s became very popular as a tourist resort, uh, also uh, Karlovy Vary, Karlsbad, uh -huh. and then, and uh, it was considered as Zlata Praha, Golden Prague, they were uh, such a tourist booklet, very famous in all Europe and uh, also in the United States, because they were prepared in English and also a uh, 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 periodical uh, uh, Czechoslovak observer uh, became a very good tool to inform about what is going in Czechoslovakia and in Prague and it became very, uh, quite accessible for all, not only tourists. So even then uh, uh, Prague became very fashionable as a tourist, not on such large because it's another technique where a hundred years later now, right? But I, yeah, we admire this beautiful Praga. We did our, uh, uh, also European, I guess, admired. So one, one other thing I think you'll be interested in, what the Americans were worried about, um, at least in 1918-19, is that the Czechs and the Slovaks were not a good match. And the reason is, I mean, they have a lot going for them, you know, being Slavs, but the Slovaks had been under Hungarian rule for so long that they had been transformed, that's the word that one of the Americans uses. And so when they speculate about what will happen when they leave, they worry that this, that the two pieces won't stay together. Um, and of course, uh, they do, until they don't. Um, for reasons, this, the separation might have nothing to do with, you know, Hungarian uh, domination for so long. But it is interesting that when the Americans arrive in Prague, uh, they see all the resources. They go to Slovakia and they see more resources uh, of a different kind, but they worry that uh, there's going to be uh, sort of rich man, poor man, and that the cultural uh, uh, ties uh, won't take hold. Yeah, and so, and we all know the outcome of that or the end of that. <laughs> uh, but uh, which would uh, do justice to some of their fears, I, I to the American fears, I, I assume originally. But you know, I always feel there's one part of this story that uh, is not sufficiently highlighted and that is the, the manner of the split, of the eventual split. And uh, the truth is that the Czechs and the Slovaks are probably the only two nations in European history who have never fought each other. Yeah. And never will probably. So uh, that is the weak history of the Czech Slovak <laughs> relationship. Uh, please, you may. <laughs> yes, uh, good afternoon, come uh, on Let's talk history. Uh, I have a question for a scholar. I I'm sorry, I can't say your name, so I have a question for a scholar from Stanford. Uh, in last month, we've been celebrating uh, funding of Czechoslovakia. So all around the conferences were in a very positive way that uh, funding of Czechoslovakia and fall of Austro-Hungarian monarchy uh, was a bad thing. So my question is, I heard personally lots of respectable scholars that the fall of Austro-Hungarian monarchy was not necessarily great. So. From your American perspective, uh, what do you think about the dismantling and fall of Austro-Hungarian monarchy? Thank you. Yeah, so um, there's uh, quite a debate now that's been reactivated in the past year um, among English language readers anyway. I uh, can't think of his name. There's a new book about the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And Woodrow Wilson, uh, or his advisors had dubbed it, had called it in 1918, uh, prison house of nations. Yeah. And right, famous phrase, infamous phrase. 
And the book, which is a very, very uh, interesting book, I haven't read it yet, uh, it's on my list, uh, but which is being challenged uh, with respectable reviews who are challenging the conclusion. Um, the, the, actually, um, the, the author uh, makes the case that in fact this was an incubator uh, of nations, right? And that in fact its breakup was avoidable and tragic. Now all of those pieces are separable. You could say it was an incubator of nations, but its time had run out during the war. You know, the, the, during the war years, and one version is the nationality stuck to Vienna uh, until Franz Josef died. And then things begin to fall apart and also to war fatigue. Uh, another is that the thing was ready to fly apart, right? Uh, and look at the Croats. Uh, and uh, just the Balkans generally, and you see pieces pulling apart, and that it was inevitable and we did the right thing. Um, but lately, um, you see a revival of the notion that what we need are larger entities, and we could have avoided a Second World War, you would have had a, a power to offset a rising Germany and a rising later USSR, um, I happen to be one of the skeptics. Uh, the closer I look, I think the thing was coming apart. Um, maybe it could have been done a little differently. Uh, maybe letting Hungary have the parts that went to Romania, Transylvania, etc. Uh, I noticed, by the way, there's a Woodrow Wilson street here. The Woodrow Wilson, is the train station still named after him? Yeah. Yeah, and it's being, that's being renovated. 28. And you go to Budapest, and there's no Woodrow Wilson anything. Right? I mean, but it, there is general band holes. General, yeah, that's yeah, right. That's right. And but they hate so, Wilson, uh, the Hungarians do. Yeah. Maybe had the dividing up been done differently, there might have been some better luck there. But I don't know. But it's an interesting question, and it's one, again, this new book on the, uh, the empire has really revived the debate. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I think we, we should look uh, uh, very complex on it. We cannot just look on dismemberment of Austria-Hungary. Because uh, uh, be, uh, until the First World War, nobody in Europe, it doesn't matter in allies countries, in Antanta or Central Powers, could imagine Europe without uh, Austria-Hungarian monarchy until uh, uh, the, that of uh, Joseph uh, II, right? Uh, so, so this is for sure. And then there is a revolution in Russia and uh, uh, the, the important part of allies uh, is expelled from, from the war. Then the, uh, the uh, central powers uh, were beaten. They collapsed. So I think it's complex, not only dismemberment itself, but Austria-Hungary was this country who also collapsed as a country. And uh, for Antanta uh, countries, uh, of course it was important to do something with their small allies and with this national movement, uh, which became stronger and more offensive in their rights for self-determination. It means independence. So uh, this is, I think, it, it, we, we should look all together that many uh, aspects, many factors, and the end of the war decided about the evaluation of uh, also American policy and a more active Wilson. Uh, um, uh, policy and his personal impact because till b before he became very uh, efficient uh, in declarations I mean uh, searching for very moral for very beautiful uh, ex uh, explanation why American became involved in the war, it was not American deal to be in war. So the moral aspect, the self-determination, the fighting with militarism, with autocracy, 
with the anarchy, revolutions, and so on, became part of official ideological uh, part of his United States policy making. And in the final ways before the, the armistice and then during the conference, peace, uh, Paris Peace Conference, it became very important, all these factors together. Uh, you already mentioned that sometimes the small nations Wilson was not familiar what they were arguing between, uh, I don't know, Romanians or uh, Czech and uh, Hungarian border. He never thought in this way or he, he never heard uh, about uh, Germans in Sudetenland and actually in some memoirs uh, there are some comments that he recognized on the road to Europe that there are more or less over three millions of uh, Sudeten Germans in Czechoslovakia, right? And he said, Masaryk never told me that. In Bonsal and some memoirs, there, there are some, this kind of uh, comments. So it means he, he uh, did know exact, actually he, there is no such a need that he had to to, to know about all details. He got uh, specialist experts, uh, Lansing, and then Mandel House, I think this name we should also uh, repeat. And uh, uh, you just uh, remember about his extremely important role in policy making. Uh, because uh, he was very familiar with many European and not only European aspects. He became his special missionary envoy before the, the conflict, before America entered the war, and he played extremely important role in preparation of peace. Later, the, the friendship was collapsed somehow and, uh, in mid-conference. Uh, uh, some in March, I think, because they were quarreled on certain issues, and first of all, on League of Nations. Uh, they, yeah. They've got different ideas on it. Well, uh, yes, there's no question that the breakup of the empire was a very complex uh, 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 thing, and, uh, and the temptation to invent alternative histories is irresistible in, 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 in among politicians and historians alike. Uh, but, uh, and it's, it's fair to remember that most of the Czech uh, uh, personalities of the Enlightenment period in the 19th century is uh, expected uh, uh, the empire to continue while demanding some sort of autonomy, even Masaryk until quite late in the uh, day did not uh, uh, did not uh, call for independence of Czechoslovakia. But at the same time, my my personal view has always been that uh, the empire was doomed the moment the Austrian-Hungarian alignment realignment came about in an empire with a Slavic minority. It was unsustainable in the long run and unsustainably proved. Uh, I see Miss Wagnerova with a question and this will have to be the last comment in this panel, please. It's a very it's a very short question. Was there any Mrs. Hoover? Or he didn't need any domestic advice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she she was Lou Henry Hoover. Hello, you Henry Hoover. And there is in Stanford a Lou Henry Hoover building, part of the Hoover complex. And of course, most Stanford undergraduates think that must be Herbert Hoover's brother with a name like Lou, right? <laughs> Big Lou Hoover. Uh, no, Lou Henry Hoover. Um, uh, uh, interesting person. Um, also a Stanford graduate, uh, also interested in mining and uh, accompanies Herbert Hoover around the world when he makes his fortune as a mining engineer. She plays a role in the Commission for Relief in Belgium 
helping uh, uh, raise funds in the United States. Um, but aside from that, she's not in the limelight, doesn't want the limelight. Um, I'm not sure what you think about it. her name being on a building, by the way, on campus. Uh, it's about to be torn down, by the way, so you want to go quickly uh, to have a look. Uh, but Lou, as she was called, was considered to be a model first lady at the time. Um, she didn't step on anyone's toes at that time, and that was important. And um, in, in all the biographies I've read of Herbert Hoover, Lou Henry Hoover is seen as the perfect accompaniment to her husband. She didn't have a lot of the social graces, nor did Herbert Hoover, um, but she didn't sort of drag him into situations that he would have been uncomfortable in. So Lou Henry Hoover, uh, LHH, uh, is what we call around the Hoover Institution, um, uh, sort of in the background, uh, but essential to Herbert Hoover's success. Mm, that sounds answer. very pre-Me Too, <laughs> by the way, saying that. Uh, uh, I just would like to add a few words, uh, because she was uh, absolutely incredible lady. She was the first woman in class in geology in Stanford when they met. Then uh, she was well educated, uh, she was polyglot, she learned a few languages, uh, some Chinese during the Boxer Rebellion they spent two years in, in China, and then, uh, first of all, she was uh, very interested in scholar uh, activities, and she mostly she, actually they both translated Dere Metallica Agricoli, uh, so a uh, very, very professional scholar, uh, a book on metallurgy, and uh, they've got a lot of honors for this. Of course, she was uh, such a good uh, <laughs> wife that she didn't pretend that it was her, mostly her own work, so she put, they did both it, and, uh, but she was honored mostly for these translations. Okay, if I can say one last yeah. thing before we end. <laughs> if you come to Stanford, go to the president's house, that is the president of the university. It used to be uh, Herbert Hoover and Lou Henry Hoover's home. Fantastic home. She designed it. She designed the whole thing, inside and out, which is fantastic. So another talent she had. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I think we owe a large hand of applause to our speakers, Halina Parafianotovic, <laughs> yeah. Bernard Patino. to our interpreters behind the screen and, uh, and to the two young ladies on my staff who helped prepare the whole uh, symposium uh, Teresa Johannides and Veronica Braziola and to you all for your attention and your questions. You yeah, applaud yourselves. <laughs> and to you. <laughs> and uh, as a reward, there's coffee, some snacks. And we will reconvene in about 15 minutes with the second panel. <laughs>